So, all right, here we go. I'm Pastor Steve. Welcome, everybody. Welcome online. So, I'm going to be up here. Uh, I'm in semi retirement. I didn't totally retire. So, still going to be up here uh, once, once a month or so. We'll see. But uh, we're finishing up our series on life in the vine. I'm going to get this a little closer, a little more interactive. And we're looking at the passage, Jesus talking to his disciples in John 15, and today specifically we're going to look at the joy of the Lord. And we at the River Church are all about knowing and loving God, knowing his word, knowing his ways, and as you get to know him, the more you will love him, and about growing, growing as children of God, growing as sons and disciples and daughters and and, uh, and loving people, because he came for people. People are forever. Amen. So we're here to, to grow in Christ and love people. So this is uh, John 15. is a time where Jesus was talking to his disciples, people, really the 12 and actually the 11, because uh, Judas had, had left. He's talking to his disciples, and these are the ones that are committed to him, that have been following him for over three years. So he's speaking some words to them, shortly before he was going to get crucified. And so the very important last words that he was wanting to share about kingdom life, about knowing him, about what they're called to, um, and about being fruitful. So this is life in the vine, about being fruitful and bringing glory to his Father. So and part of the benefit to us is having the joy of the Lord, which isn't the joy like the world provides joy, it's not just about being happy. It's not just about the pursuit of happiness. As, as much as we respect our national, you know, U.S. Constitution, it's not just about pursuing happiness or the freedom to do that, but it's about joy, which goes much deeper and lasts much longer. So, earthly joy comes and it goes. I was just in, uh, we got a chance to go to Brainerd, where we have grandkids and, and kids, and uh, went to a couple of dance recitals, which is always a hoot to see uh, four-year-olds, six-year-olds, and seven, eight-year-olds uh, at their dance recital end of the year. And also our, our oldest grandson just turned a teenager, 13, so pretty wild uh, that he's 13, and so that happened both on, the, we went Thursday or Friday came back yesterday just one night but it was great and it's just amazing how joyful times come and joyful times go that, that clock just keeps moving in the earthly sense our grandson who turned 13 um, I can remember like it was yesterday when he was maybe two years old in a high chair you know and wanting to pray before dinner you know I do it you know I'll pray and his prayer, his meal prayer was puppies, 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 and kitties. Amen. <laughs> In his perspective, his realm of what's important to give thanks for, and that was what he gave thanks for. And <laughs> we have it on video. It's great. And now, 13, he's, he's interested in 13-year-old things like hunting, like trapping, like turning wood on a lathe, like 3D printing. Um, he's, he's got power tool catalogs that he loves to go through. Just, uh, he reads, he, he reads uh, Cabela's catalogs like some people read the Bible, you know. It's like he just goes through that thing and he knows all the PSI and the diff, this and that. Anyway, he's, he's grown up, so, so earthly joys come and go, but we're going to look at a joy that's much bigger, which is the joy of the Lord. Amen. So I want to read uh, John, just three verses out of John 15, 9, 10, and 11, and we're going to end there. So let's read 9 together here. It says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. This is life in the vine. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
In verse 11, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. So Lord, let's, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word that applies to us right now. Lord, thank you that you, you're here with us and, and you want to reveal the truth, God, these words that bring life, that, that are alive. So Lord, I pray you'd bless, bless our time. Thank you for your great love. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So first, number one point right away, joy comes from the words of Jesus. And this is what he said, these things I have spoken to you. Another passage in, in uh, 1 John talks about these things we write. We write these things. These things were written that your joy may be full. And he's saying, these things I have spoken to you, these words, so that my joy may be in you. Um, so many of the words uh, of Jesus are written and are spoken and are recorded and are preserved throughout history for our joy. For example, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, heavy burdened. Whoever believes in me will not perish. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. All the words of Jesus, I mean, just go down and could just keep going and going, are spoken, are written to us for his joy to be in us, his life, his peace to be in us. And that's why at the river you will perpetually be encouraged, exhorted, reminded, and maybe even a little badgered to read the Bible. Read the Bible. Amen. Read it for yourself. I stop short of be uh, provoked or be guilted or shamed. Not that. We won't, we won't go that far. Badgered is about as far as I'll go a little bit. And, and you know, we've heard of the whole AI, okay? AI, artificial intelligence. And the pros and cons, which I see a lot of things, including the Internet, like the, no, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's some really good things about it. There's some really evil things about it. Um, there, it's nothing new in the sense of what man makes or what's out there that can be really powerfully good and really powerfully bad, depending on how we use it. So there's the example, and you've probably all heard of this, where the, now, nowadays, you know how this call may be recorded for, uh, you know, training purposes, and, and it's recorded. Your voice is recorded. Well, now they, they have ways of taking a, f a few words, three seconds of your voice, and they can make it sound like you are having a conversation. They can create things that, that sound like you're saying it, and they use that against people. They call, hey, and it's, and it's the granddaughter. Oh, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble, Mom. Or Grandma, send me $1,000. And then the phone, they take the phone away from this artificial version of the granddaughter's voice. And it's a guy saying, if you don't, you know, give me $1,000 and send it to here. And, and that's a scam that has been pretty successful that we need to be aware of. Now, I'm hearing that um, and it wasn't on the Internet. I heard it on the radio. Um, even more true, yeah. More reliable. But they're saying that this, the Bible on your phone, digital and audio Bibles, they have AI ways of changing the Bible, changing the program that you assume is a good program, but they are manipulating. And there's powers of darkness, and there's people that are wanting to eradicate the truth, eradicate Christianity from the world. They are manipulating the stories uh, to say things that it's not, that's not true, that's not in the original manuscript. So I want to just encourage you as your pastor, get a paper Bible. Get a real Bible that you are looking at page by page and you are seeing the context of other things. I, I, I know there's a phone Bible that comes in handy at times, and it's, I don't think it's just me being old-fashioned. 
okay? Get a real Bible. Read the real thing. And you know when this is in your home, no one's going to change this. And governments might come and try to take it, but that's not happening yet. But they aren't going to be able to edit this while it's in your possession. And so find, and I would say, talk to Pastor Tony or myself about what Bible, what is a good Bible, what is a good version of the Bible for you to read. So be careful of that, that stuff. It's just a lot of evil out there. So read the Bible, read it. I'm badgering you, read the Bible. No, just, a, just a little bit, a little bit of badgering. So we think joy comes from good circumstances, from having a good job, a loving family, healthy family, money in the bank, uh, vehicles that work. Um, but we tend to think that good things should stay good. I don't know where we get that idea, that good things should just stay good all the time for us to have joy. Did, did things always go well for Jesus? How about the disciples? Things always go well for them? Uh, was was Jesus' joy based on his good circumstances? Earthly joy is very temporal. Um, but the words of Jesus will outlast this earth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. By no means will they ever pass away. Um, so, he spoke these words to us so that his joy, his joy, so that my joy will be in us. So what kind of joy did he have that he wants in us? Number two, his joy is supernatural. Supernatural joy of Jesus. Um, I appreciate the old movies of, of Jesus, you know, the old 70s, uh, 60s movies, but the the character, the personality of Jesus they portray is this somber, pious, almost like he's grieving all the time. Um, mournful, this sad, mournful Jesus. It, which is, I've only seen one season, but I appreciate The Chosen, the series, the new series, Chosen. I appreciate the personality that they give him because they portray him as joyful, as having a great sense of humor, which I like humor. <laughs> I like to, uh, I like dad jokes. I'll admit it. I love a good dad joke. If you, if you got any new ones, let me know. I like the old ones. It's just, there's something about just being silly. I like to be silly with grandkids. I like to have fun. I like to get people to laugh. And I think Jesus did too. I think that we, we, we have this filter in our mind as we read the scripture that Jesus was always serious, stern. And, and yes, he is a serious, stern uh, person at times. But the, in fact, the example of the rich man comes to Jesus and, and Jesus is talking about it's, it's more difficult. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. And scholars have said, and I've read some things about, scholars say there's a certain gate in, the, in Jerusalem and the wall that's a low doorway and it's narrow and they'd have to get the camel down to crawl through there. And the, It's called the needle. This opening is called the needle. And the camel would get through there with this stuff and it's like, and it can be done. And it's like, I don't think so. Personally, I think Jesus is making an outlandish example, saying it's easier to stuff a full-grown camel through the eye of a needle that you use to sew thread with um, because he said in other places, it's impossible for a rich man to enter heaven. So it's not just difficult, and if you kneel right, and if you, the camel does this, you can get through, and this is how the camels got through all the time. It's like, no, Jesus is saying a ridiculous, it's not exactly a dad joke, but it's closer to a dad joke than it is to a doctrinal thesis. 
um, that he has a sense of humor. I think he has a really good sense of humor. I'm talking about the kind of joy that he wants in us. His joy. Psalm 50 or 45, 7 says, You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. The oil of joy. Jesus was anointed. And it repeats it in, in the book of Hebrews. So Old Testament and New Testament affirms it. Jesus was anointed with the oil of joy. I'd love to know who his companions were. Anyways, a little side note. But um, Many times, Jesus, it talks about the joy of the Lord, the joy of Jesus. When the disciples went out two by two, what did they go out? What were they sent out to do? To preach the kingdom, share the good news, heal the sick, raise the dead. These are some, and cast out demons, cast out demons. And it says they came back rejoicing that the demons were subject to them. And it, in, in Luke 10 is the story, and it talks about Jesus said, well, don't rejoice because demons are subject to you, but that your names are written in the book of life. And then it says, Jesus, filled with joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, for revealing these things to little children. Um, and it says, Jesus, filled with joy through the Holy Spirit. And in that passage, the wording in that specific area, uh, they talk about, again, scholars talk about the, the Greek words, it says, Jesus, full of joy, the word is like pirouette, like he spun like a little kid. Like I'm watching my grandkids yesterday on the trampoline. Papa, watch this. Watch this trick I can do. So I'm getting ready for the trick, and their trick is on the trampoline, and they go. That's the trick. It's like, good job. Good job. But that's the idea of Jesus, full of joy, and the word is like, Yes. And he's telling them that he's thanking his father. And they're coming back from cities where people are sick, dying, demon-possessed, in darkness, because they're being told the good news of the kingdom of God. Preach the gospel. Tell the good news. And they came back rejoicing. And so the, in the context of these really dark situations, you know, hopeless situations, they're sharing hope and good news. And they're loving it. And they were, lo Jesus was loving it. And another example, uh, Nehemiah 8.10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. How many of you have heard this phrase? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, again, the setting of this passage is the wall was just rebuilt. Israel came is coming out of exile, coming out of captivity from Persia. And Nehemiah got permission from the Persian king to go back and rebuild the wall, and he, and he allowed some of the Israelites to go back and rebuild it. And, and in the setting, and they're, why grieve? You know, why would he say, don't grieve? In the setting of this situation is their city was destroyed. The systems were gone. The government was non-existent. It was a place, Jerusalem was a place of, of coyotes and dogs and, you know, uh, buzzards and just a, just a desolate place that they, they are only at the point of rebuilding the protective wall around it. And that was so moving that they were grieving as they finished the wall. And in the context of the joy of the Lord is your strength, is just a, the beginnings of restoration, of, of restoring what was beautiful Jerusalem. And so there's always a context of darkness when you see the joy of the Lord 
And to the degree of darkness, the degree of the joy of God is, is exponential. So that's another um, time that was dark, including Isaiah 51, 11, says the ransomed of the Lord will return. They'll enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Again, a similar time where Israel was devastated because of their rebellion against God. And how God is saying, the day will come, the day will come when you will be coming in singing. Coming into Jerusalem, another name, Zion. An everlasting joy, not temporary joy, not a little bit, not just a couple of sparklers and a few, you know, but everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. They won't be able to handle it. And sorrow and sign will flee away. So another one of these examples of the context of joy versus tough times. Jesus is anointed with the oil of joy above all his companions. And that's why we study him. That's why we want to get to know him. That's why we talk about him. That's why we want to gather with others who care and want to know about him, who he is, what he's like. Uh, and that's why we fix our eyes on him and not the things of this world. Focus on him. But the world is full of sickness and sin and death. That's why we focus on Jesus. Like, yes, it is. And he overcame all of those things. All of the above. And yes, that's real stuff. We put, and to put our attention more on the sickness and the sin and the death is forgetting about the one who overcame sickness, sin, and death. Focus on him. He is far more powerful than any of that stuff. Any of that stuff. Any of the craziness that the devil is thrashing in his last days. He is, his days are numbered and ugliness is coming right out in the open. But Jesus is the victorious one. Fix your eyes on him. So, um, and speaking of, just, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. So we know it's coming, but take heart, rejoice at all times, Give thanks in everything, right? His joy strengthens us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It's everlasting. It doesn't wear out. Um, it's not of this world. His joy is not of this world. We were driving, driving back from Brainerd, and we got four grandkids that are, none are in this room. They're all downstairs somewhere. Um, <laughs> I didn't get permission, but I got gotta share it. We're, we're doing 20 questions and going around and we got um, so a 10 year old down to a 4 year old. 11 yes sorry. 11 year old down to a 4 year old. And uh, Shepard is the 4 year old. It was his turn and, and he was doing and he's a pretty smart little guy. Um, but you know is person place your thing is it bigger than a Microwave it used to be bread box. I don't know where bread box is. It's bigger than a microwave. And then it's like, it's bigger than a semi truck. So it's like, okay, his thing was bigger than a semi truck. And it lived in the forest. And we're, we're just going through. It's like, and earlier, I'll just preface this earlier, his first one that also stumped us, believe it or not. We, we never got it. Uh, we wore out our 20 questions, and we, we gave up, and it was a giant robot bunny. <laughs> that, was, that was his first one. So we're like, whoa, good one, chef. Yeah. So no wonder we didn't get that one. And, and so we're kind of, that was what we're prepped for, you know, with his second time around. 
And so it lives in the forest, bigger than a semi-truck. It's alive, and, and we're just throwing out. And we finally we give up. We, we give up. And, and I mean, we're, we're, we didn't throw in the towel yet. And someone said, did you just make this up? He goes, yeah. <laughs> he just this chuckling, yeah. And then, and uh, we don't know what it is yet. And one of the, one of the ki- Ezra says, well, it, it could be a giant ice cream cone. You know, I mean, he's just like, it could be absolutely anything. There's no way. And we finally tried a few more guesses and finally said, all right, we give up. And it was a, gira- a giraffe. It was a giraffe. <laughs> a giraffe. And it occurred to <laughs> it's like, it lives in the forest, <laughs> bigger than a semi-truck. Um, but when it occurred to me, when, in his mind, when we asked, when he was asked, did you just make this up? Meaning, we're thinking it's something fictional, you know, like totally out of nowhere. He's like, no, I really did come up with this. I came up with this. So, because uh, he's like, yeah, <laughs> I made it up. And, and it's the joy of the Lord is not of this world, but it's not just made up. <laughs> it, is, it is real. It's real. A giraffe is real. It doesn't live in the forest. <laughs> and yeah, it's kind of bigger than a semi, if you look at it one way. But the joy of the Lord is not of this earth, but it's of the earth. You know what I mean? It's, it's around here. It's possible. It's attainable to live in that in a, in a daily basis. His joy is supernatural. And the third point, Jesus wants our little cup of joy filled with his joy. And someone said that miserable is the Christian who knows better than to enjoy the pleasure of sin but doesn't love God enough to, the, to enjoy the pleasure of his presence. Yeah. Miserable is the Christian who knows better than to enjoy the pleasure of sin but doesn't love God enough to enjoy the pleasure of his presence. And I think They don't outright give in to sin, but they also don't deliberately pursue God. So they they don't walk in guilt because they're not in open sin, but they also don't walk in the joy of the Lord because their idea of knowing God is this bland, stay-out-of-trouble world. So they think they're a Christian, abiding in the vine, but they're not really pursuing God. They're just not pursuing evil. And so they're devoid of real joy. And that is a a sad situation to hear, I'm just not getting anything out of this whole Jesus thing. I tried Christianity. I didn't get anything out of it. It doesn't work like that. You don't go halfway. You don't go halfway away from sin and halfway towards God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And and if you don't, you're just you're just staying out of trouble. Which you're really not staying out of trouble. You're deceived in thinking you're staying out of trouble. And so, verse 9 says, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Jesus specifically describes the way he loves his disciples by saying it's the way the Father loved him. The way the Father loved me, that's how I love you. The love... Jesus has for you as his disciple is so strong that he compares it to only one relationship and not, not to a I love you like a mother loves her baby. 
He doesn't say, I love you like a husband loves his wife. He doesn't say, I love you like a soldier loves his war buddy who went through extreme danger together. The one he chooses to use to paint a picture is, I love you like my father loved me. The Heavenly Father. And as you read the Bible, it's impossible to not see and not understand the profound love the Heavenly Father had for His Son. Even the examples of the pictures, the, the, the shadows of Christ. Abraham choosing to offer up his son Isaac on the altar. But he didn't actually do it. God stopped him, but he was willing. By faith he did it. Whereas the Father, God, actually did it. Because there was no other way. Uh, Charles Spurgeon came across a quote. It says, Beloved, you do not, dare not, could not, doubt the love of the Father to his Son. It is one of those unquestionable truths about which you never dreamed of holding an argument. Our Lord would have us place his love to us in the same category with the Father's love to himself. We are to be as confident of the one as of the other. That's the comparison. The love of the Father for the Son has no beginning, has no end. It's up close, it's personal. It's unchangeable. The, the joy of the Lord, the joy that Jesus has because of that kind of love toward Him by His Father, is the same joy that Jesus wants in us. His joy didn't come from staying out of trouble. His joy didn't come from not making his dad mad. Which I know some Christians, they like to dance by the edge of the cliff. I'm not sinning, I'm not sinning, I'm not sinning. Well, why are you by the edge? What are you doing there? I didn't. I didn't sin. Well, get away from the edge. His joy isn't limited to having a stress-free life. Who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. His joy didn't come from doing whatever he wanted. Well, if I had his money, if I had his car, if I had his job, if I had, then I'd be joyful too. His joy didn't come from doing whatever he wanted. Not my will, Father, but yours. Yours be done. His joy came from abiding in the love of the Father. A closeness to his Father. And from that abiding flowed obedience to do whatever his father said. Because he completely trusted that there was nothing dark, nothing evil or self-serving regarding the father's commands on his life. That no matter what he told him to do, he did it. I don't do anything except what the Father tells me to do. When we were in Israel, first time, there's this, you get to know uh, about 50 people pretty well. Because you're with this one group, and you stay in a hotel, you eat meals together, you travel, go to these sites together, you get to know people pretty well. And there's this one couple from Texas, elderly, retired couple, that got to know, and uh, she had this camera, <laughs> old digital camera, which 
at that time, digital cameras were pretty new. And she wanted help with it. And I'm a former professional photographer. <laughs> but these little digital cameras have this, kind of new to those. So I'm going through her pictures, and it was about the second day of these amazing historic sites in Israel. And I accidentally wiped it. I wiped it clean. I deleted all of her photos while sitting in the bus. And she's right, you know, over here. And the panic and the horror in my, I am just like, no, 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 no. Where, where I'm looking all over and this little, you know, these little, and I finally fessed up to it. I had to tell her, tell them, and uh, <laughs> how she responded it wasn't that day. She responded, great. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'm not a good photographer. Or any, you know, she's like, oh, they're the bad pictures. I don't, just super gracious. But it was mostly what she said <laughs> the next day. Because I didn't want to go near. <laughs> I was, I was so embarrassed and ashamed. I was like, I'm a photographer. That I didn't want to look at her. <laughs> and she, she pulled me aside and she said, <laughs> don't you dare avoid me. <laughs> she says, don't you dare avoid us. We're friends. And we have learned to trust whatever God allows in our lives. And I never forgot that. We have learned to trust whatever God allows in our lives. So, this is the kind of joy Father, you, whatever you tell me to do, I'm doing it. Go to the cross. All right. Father, if there's any other way, take this, let this cup pass. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. And he went to the cross. When God tells you to do something, you can absolutely trust he knows exactly what he's doing. He's working in everything about you and everyone around you. This is the kind of joy that Jesus wants us filled with or complete in. The same Greek word that's used here about that your joy may be full is the word referred to an empty vessel that's filled to the brim. That's filled. The New Living Translation says overflowing. But almost every version of the Bible says full. NIV says that it be made complete. But it's the same idea that it's filled to capacity, to maximum capacity. The same word that is used where the disciples filled 12 baskets full of leftovers of the fish and the bread. Full. Jesus used the same word when he said, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. It's the same word. So what was lacking in the, in the righteousness of, of man, Jesus fulfilled it. What was lacking in the ability to fulfill the law of God with mankind, Jesus fulfilled it. And what was lacking in your joy, Jesus came to fill it. Amen. To fill it up. 
to where there you can't handle anymore. There is no more room. To where everything, every doubt, every fear, every, every part of your uh, unbelief, whatever it might be, you can't have both. You can't be full of joy and full of fear. You can't be full of faith and full of doubt. He came to have his joy fill and all those other things have to go. Amen. Sighing and sorrow will flee away. And I'll say it again, we walk in the, the joy of the Lord through abiding and obeying. Being with others who love Jesus, with others who live for Jesus, others who want to obey Jesus. The joy comes through abiding and obeying. And it's not mystical, it's not mysterious. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made full. So I want to I want to close with that picture. Show this. This is the night uh, that we were there. The only night. This was Friday night. This is my son-in-law's view of the northern lights over their barn. One of their buildings. And uh, gorgeous. Gorgeous northern lights. Um, and and I'm, my wife and I totally missed this. We went to bed a little early. <laughs> kind of wiped out with the grandkids and not just the four, but the six that are there. So ten grandkids. Uh, played hard that day and it's like, oh, we're ready for bed. And we went to bed and like ten minutes later, they noticed this outside, and my son-in-law, Joel, said, I thought about waking you up. He's like, oh, I wish you would have woke us up. Haven't seen the northern lights for years. And we too easily settle for pretty good. We settle for joy, good things. Uh, we're content with trying to please God and stay out of trouble and do this. And, but God has so much more, so much more for us than we realize. And sometimes we sleep through <laughs> what he wants to do. And what makes this glorious is all this darkness around. What makes that glorious is darkness. During the day, you don't see that. When things are going good, you don't press into God. And The joy of the Lord we miss when we're not looking for it. Right? When we're distracted with just stay out of trouble. Don't go to the bar. Don't do whatever, you know, that you used to do or don't do this. It's like God has so much more for us than just staying out of trouble. There is a life, a glorious, supernatural life that he wants to give us, but we only will see it if we position ourselves to be in his presence, in his will, in obedience. And it, it you know, this day and age, obedience sounds like a swear word almost. It's like, oh, I'm talking about me. You know, judge not, and this, uh, you know, you're being judgmental. It's like, no, just obey God. Obey God. Because he's a holy God. He's a holy God. He doesn't share his holiness with rebellion and disobedience. The 
the joy of the Lord that was their strength was Israel coming back into obedience to God. Turning from their rebellious ways and the exile and, and coming back. That was where the joy, that's where the famous, the joy of the Lord is our strength comes from. So, joy is the number two fruit of life in the vine right after love. Love, joy, and second only to peace. Those are some pretty good fruits of the Spirit. So let's stand up. Let me close. Thank you, Lord. And of course, we always want to ask, do you know him? Are you his disciple? Because that's who he was speaking to, John 15. He's talking to those who follow hard after him, who have surrendered to his will. Because if, if you're not his disciple, none of what I said will make sense. It'll just be rules. And, and, and your ears will hear, oh, that pastor just doesn't want me to have fun. Or he just doesn't want me to be free, be myself, be how God made me. It's like, no, I'm calling you to be a disciple of Christ forever. Amen. To live forever. To give your life. To hand your life over to Jesus. Put your trust in him now while you can. We don't have a guarantee of tomorrow. So Lord, thank you, God, for your great joy that you want to give us. Lord, thank you that you are the, the true vine. You're the life giver. And you're the one who gives us the ability to bear fruit. Lord, I just pray for everyone here, God, that we would press into you and not just stay out of trouble, not just not do bad things, but we would pursue you. And not just even do good things, because unless you're saying to do it, it might just be busyness might be the wrong direction that you call us to. So Lord, I pray that we would press into you. Thank you for the examples, the natural examples of a grapevine. That you help us to understand that as we abide in you, your life flows into us. We abide in you in obedience and nearness. Your, your life, your increase, your fruit comes. And we will want to obey. We will want to do what you call us to do. Lord, bless this week. God, thank you for this beautiful weather. Thank you for the, the beautiful season that we're in, God. Help us to enjoy it. But Lord, I pray that we would press into you, the lover of our souls. Thank you for the cross and what you did for us making a way. Hallelujah. If you need prayer for anything, just come on up. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.